Good morning, one and all. I am Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi, working as additional professor in the Department of Anatomy at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh. Today, I will be talking about the publication ethics, role, and responsibility of authors. So it is my great privilege to share my experience as editor in chief of the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, and I'll share my experience on this academic platform to help my colleagues publish in anatomy or various other journals, you say. I do not claim that the images which have been taken in this presentation belongs to me. It has been taken from various sources like internet or from the various websites, you can say like Google, etc. Just to give a brief introduction about myself, I'm the chief editor or the only editor of the Snails Clinical Neuroanatomy, which is read globally, right? And otherwise it is also called as the Bible of Neuroanatomy. So I'm the editor of the South, first South Asian edition. Apart from that, I have the honor to review this Grey's Anatomy International Edition which is read globally, and it is one of the reference book of anatomy. As I said that I'm the editor-in-chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, which is an official publication of the Society of Clinical Anatomists. So today's talk will be as an editor's perspective of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy. Uh, I will not discuss about my journey as editor in chief because of the uh, limitation of the time. But when we talk about this today's topic, that is publication ethics, right? As editor in chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, I'll say that the evolution of the modern science, as well as this professional advancement, depends on the publication of the scientific papers. But at the same time, it comes with a lot of responsibilities. So an author must be familiar with acceptable, or you say, the good publication practice. And it should be followed by the authors to avoid the various kind of the scientific misconduct and research fraud. Why it is so? Because the society and the healthcare research may suffer as a result of the publications that draw uh, conclusions, you say, on the basis of the manipulated or you say the fabricated or the falsification of the data. So I feel that research can only flourish if it is carried out and documented with complete integrity and ethics. But unfortunately, what is happening that this publish or perish attitude, right, has led to this unethical practices in scientific research and publications. So what I wanted to say to uh, av avoid or prevent this scientific misconduct and implementation of this good publication practices, the junior researchers or you say the postgraduate students must be identified, acknowledged, and made aware of this publication ethics. But before we go into the ethics, first let us see what motivates or compels us to publish, right? Truly speaking, most of the times we publish because it is mandatory for promotion. Like when we talk about this National Medical, Medical Commission, this Medi National Medical Commission has given the guidelines that from uh, assistant to associate, if one has to be promoted, they must have one publication, which must be indexed under DOAJ, Scopus, or PubMed, etc. Right. Similarly, when one has to be promoted from associate to professor during the tenure of this associate professorship, right, they should publish three uh, manuscripts: the original articles, or you say the meta-analysis, or the a systematic review, right, during this tenure of associate professorship. So what I wanted to say 
that basically in our country, we publish because for the promotion, it is mandatory, right? But there are people who publishes because of, uh, you say, out of passion, right? And it gives nice feel to see the number of the citations you say, or the H index or the I ITIN index. And you will be surprised to know that nowadays people even mention their H index or uh, you say the ITIN index in their visiting card. So you can understand that what kind of pleasure they have uh, in publishing their manuscripts and having their H index or the ITIN index, right? So not only what I wanted to say that though uh, people publish because of the promotion and some of the people uh, publish because of the passion as well. Now, why actually we publish? So most of the time, research is for the betterment of the human life, right? It plays important role in evolution. Hence, this publication abides by uh, certain rules and regulations which are called as the ethics or we say the good publication practice. So people may publish uh, to improve their writing skill, to upgrade the knowledge, or you say to recognize their research, to access the quality. But actually, there are publications to help the society with their research. And on the basis of their research, their innovations, right, the various drugs or where discoveries are there to help the society, you say, right? So when we see about the history of the publication, right? We'll just have a quick look of the history of the public, you say, the publication history, right? So when we talk about the publication history, it dates uh, back to the 1665, right? So the first known scientific journal, which was dedicated to science, was by the Royal Society of Britain. Right, and it was led by the Henry Oldenburg, who was the chief editor of this journal. You say so. This was the first known scientific journal dedicated to science, and this was the oldest, or you say, the longest journal which has been published till date. So the the aim of this journal was to create the public record of original contribution to knowledge and also to encourage scientists to speak directly, you say, to the uh, public or the others. And now we have n number of journals in various fields. Even if you talk about the anatomy, in anatomy, we have n number of journals, right? Now, coming to the ethics and the good publication practice, as we have already seen the history of publications, and the need of, of the publications. So what are the publication ethics? So the, in other words, this publication ethics can be defined as the set of fund fundamental values, attitudes, and norms which are considered by most of the population as essential for personal life or life with one another and life in relation to a society's institution. So, what I wanted to say that since our research or publication is contributing to the growth of the mankind, it should be abided by the ethics. And author must be aware of the good publication practices while refraining from this scientific misconduct or you say the research frauds. So author should adhere to the good publication practice. Now. When we see this good publication practice, we can say that publications which draw conclusions from the manipulated or the fabricated data will prove detrimental to the society and healthcare research, as I said in the past. And the good science can blossom only when the research is conducted and documented with, uh, you say, the complete honesty and the ethics. So there is need to identify, acknowledge, and generate awareness among the colleagues, you say, or the junior researchers, uh, to curb the scientific misconduct and adopt 
this good uh, publication practice. Now, this good research, when we talk about this good research involves uh, many coordinated steps. Like it starts from this hypothesis, the selection of the appropriate study design, then the study execution, apart from that, the data collection, analysis, and finally it uh, sees the, or finally it comes to the publications. So not only the conduct of the study requires ethics to be adhered uh, to, but also the process of this publication comes under the purview of ethics. So any publication that uh, you say uh, reports the results and draws the conclusions from the data which have been manipulated is considered as the research fraud or you say the scientific misconduct, right? Now, when we talk about this scientific research misconduct, right, it is defined as the scientific misconduct is the violation of the standard codes of scholarly conduct and ethical behavior in the publication of the scientific research. Now, when we talk about this, right, the ethical violation, uh, you say the ethical violation in conducting this medical research will always promote this unethical publications, right? So when there is a violation in the conducting the research, right, ethical violation in conducting the research, it will definitely lead to the unethical publications as well. And this will have impact uh, on the researchers because Suppose whatever the methodology they have defined in the publications, right? Any, the, the other researchers will uh, follow the same uh, methodologies which have been published by the previous authors and that will have impact on the researchers. And because of that, there will be, it will lead to the wrong practices or applications on the patients. So because of that, recently this Lancet retracted a uh, study which has been, uh, which was uh, entitled as uh, this hydroxychloroquine or the chloroquine with, or you say without a macro light for treatment of COVID-19, a multinational uh, registry analysis. So because the veracity of the data underlying this observed study could not be assured by the authors. So the Lancet has retracted this article after publishing in the uh, Lancet. Now, coming to the types of the scientific misconduct, there are various types of scientific misconduct as we have understood the, what do you mean by this scientific misconduct? We will see the different forms of the scientific misconduct, like the plagiarism, inappropriate claims of the authorship, the simultaneous duplicate or the salami publications, Apart from that, we have this predatory publishing or the failure to seek ethical approval or the informed consent from the patients, non-declaration of the conflict of interest, and apart from that, the falsification or the fabrication of the data. Among these all, the last one, that is the falsification or the fabrication of the data is the gravest form of the scientific misconduct, wherein the authors either manipulate skewed data to look the favorable or you say uh, generate data where no data exists. So this is the gravest form of the misconduct you can say that is the falsification or the fabrication of the data. Now when we talk about this plagiarism, this is the most common form of the misconduct, right? Now what do you mean by this plagiarism? So it is the act of the presenting author's work or ideas as your own, right? It can be two types. One is the self plagiarism or another we say that is the mosaic plagiarism. So what do you mean by this self plagiarism? Self plagiarism is the practice of an author uh, using portions of their previous writings on the same topic in their subsequent publications without specifically citing uh, it uh, you say formally in quotes. So whatever the publications they had uh, uh, in the past, they have published the same thing they will be uh, quoting in the uh, uh, publications, but they will not 
cite their uh, previous publications. That is called as the self plagiarism. Now, coming to the mosaic plagiarism, uh, it is one of the hybrid varieties of plagiarism, you say, where the author steals the idea, opinion, or you say the words and phrases from different sources and merges these words without acknowledging the original authors. So that is called as the mosaic plagiarism. Now, when we see in this slide over here, uh, in the journal, we have received the various manuscripts in which up to 1999, uh, you say 99% uh, similarity index was there, or you can say the plagiarism were there, right? Now, when we see over here, in our journal, it is compulsory that similarity index must not be more than 15%, right? We use uh, turn it in and give report. So this is 15% is for the, you say the nouns or you say the technical terms. Usually uh, whenever we receive any manuscript, which is, and the similarity index is more than 15, uh, 50%, right, five zero, it gets automatically uh, rejected. So I would suggest that do not copy from others, right? To some extent, uh, as far as possible, avoid plagiarism, right? And always understand that the concept and try to write the things in your own words, right? Rather than copying from the various sources. So author must always obtain permission for use of published illustration, Authors should avoid writing uh, multiple separate articles if he can present a large or you say the complex study in a cohesive manner in a single article, right? So we must avoid uh, plagiarism. Now coming to the, the authorship. Now the question arises, who is author, right? So the person author is the one uh, who has substantial contributions to the conception and design data collection or analysis and interpretation of the data, drafting the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content and final approval of the version to be published. So if they have contributed in any of these, right, they will be qualifying for the authorship, right? Now, these do not qualify for the author, like technical advisor, translator, medical writers, funding agency, or a statistician. This will not qualify for the author. Suppose I'm not very good at English. I cannot write the manuscript in, a, in an appropriate way. I'll take the help of the medical writers, right? But uh, suppose the medical writers have scripted, the written the uh, manuscript, but they do not qualify for uh, this authorship. Similarly, suppose I'm not good at statistics, but I have taken the help of the statistician. It doesn't mean that a statistician will qualify for the authorship or uh, some organizations, somebody has funded uh, this grant for the uh, study. It doesn't mean that they will qualify for the authorship. So these uh, people, they do not qualify for the authorship. Now, this authorship misconduct includes the ghost author, you say, or the guest author and the gifted author, right? A ghost author is a person who has made a substantial contribution to the research or writing of a manuscript, but is not listed as an author, right? It is dishonest to omit an author, right? Who has made significant contributions. In contrast to the ghost author, the guest or the gifted or honorary author is someone who is named as an author, but who did not contribute in a, uh, you say the meaningful way to the design, research, analysis, or writing of the manuscript. So those will be called as the, you say, the guest or the gift author. So no need to mention, I guess, gifting authorship to friend, partner, relative, or HODC. Right. So uh, I have seen that there are institutions right from uh, where you will find that whatever the articles are being published from a particular department in all the manuscripts or in all the articles, the name of the HOD will be there. 
so it should be avoided until unless the hod has contributed significantly right or the principal or the dean has contributed significantly in the research or in writing the manuscript or giving some intellectual ideas they should not be given the authorship right so often the guest or you say the gift authors are well known and well respected in the field of research the inclusion of their names in the author list might increase the chances of acceptance for publications but we should avoid practicing such kind of things right whatever may be the cause the gift or the guest authorship is an unacceptable practice in the publication now there are authorship issues like there will be the uh, disputes which uh, could range from the authorship inclusion or the exclusion of the authors the number of authors or you say uh, the request for addition of authors after submission or even after publication is quite common right even uh, when we accept the manuscript after that somebody will request for the removal or the addition of the authors so all these uh, should be avoided right the regarding this authorship the icmg that is the international committee of the uh, medical journal editors or the committee uh, of uh, this publication ethics or the world association of medical editors they have given the guidelines for the authorship who all will qualify this the authorship so what i would suggest that uh, from the starting point when you are designing the research right according uh, from the inception only we should uh, decide that who will qualify who will be the first author whose contribution will be more accordingly the author should uh, authorship should be decided so the who will be the first author who will be the corresponding author who will be the last author so from the inception only it should be decided so there will be no confusion or the to, just to avoid any kind of uh, conflict now how to prevent this right this authorship so the best way to prevent any kind of disputes in the authorship is to generate awareness among the research groups about the authorship criteria and to develop this standard operating procedure for the conduct and the publication of the research so the cope guidelines are to be referred in case of the authorship or in case of the any conflict you can say so the next best option to prevent disputes is to have open discussion among all uh, you say authors involved in the multidisciplinary research prior to the initiating research that is at the time of the protocol drafting only right so defining the role and the responsibilities of each author further reduces the chances of disputes within the research team so editors do ask for the individual contribution of authors in designing the manuscript the journal can blacklist the guest or the ghost authors now in many journals you will have to mention the role of the each authors right that who was involved in the uh, data collection who was involved in the analysis who was involved in the uh, writing or the reviewing of the manuscript who was involved in the study design so all these things you need to mention nowadays right now coming to the simultaneous publication so the simultaneous publication occurs when a person submits a paper to different journals at the time of submitting to one journal at the same time when the individual or the when author sub uh, submitted the same manuscript to other journals that can result in more than one journal publishing that particular paper so this is is the simultaneous uh, publication and faculty believe that the more publications they have the farther they advance professionally hence there is very bad practice in some of uh, some to do this uh, simultaneous publications we must avoid uh, submitting the manuscript to different journals at the same time so the question arises how to avoid right so what i wanted to say that this avoid submitting a paper to more 
than one journal at a time. Even if a submitted paper is currently under review and you do not know the status, wait, have patience, right? Wait to hear back from the publishers before approaching another journal. It is better that you go before, at the time of submission only, you go through the website of the journal, you will come to know that this journal, how much time it takes uh, in giving the first decision, you say, or the final decision, or uh, from acceptance to publication, right? Or from submission to publication, how much time it takes. So accordingly, you should decide, right? Uh, that in which journal you should suppose uh, uh, you should submit your manuscript, right? There are other factors also you should think before submitting uh, to a particular journal, like the acceptance rate you can think of, the publication charges you can think of, the acceptance rate you can think of, the impact factor, right? The mission, uh, uh, you say, the scope of the journal you can think of. So there are several factors, right? You should think before submitting uh, your manuscript to a particular journal, but as far as possible, you must avoid submitting to more than one journal. At a time, you should submit to your manuscript to one journal only, right? Now, the duplicate submission. When an author submits a paper or portions of his or her own paper that has been previously published to another journal, without disclosing prior submissions, that is called as the duplicate submi uh, uh, submissions, you say, right? So as per copyright law and publication ethics, where whatever is available in the journal would be original, unless there is a clear statement that the author and editor are inter intentionally republishing an article, right? So when, which if you have published your manuscript uh, previously in some journal, you must mention, right, and you must cite that. Even suppose uh, you have presented your work in some of the conferences, right? So the conference proceeding is there, right? They might have published in the abstract. So you must mention in your manuscript that this study was presented in this conference and mention, cite about your abstract, right? So that will uh, avoid uh, this duplication of the publication, right? And that will be the breach of the copyright and against the ethical conduct. So in addition, duplication of publication causes waste of, you say, the limited resources and also leads to inappropriate weighting of the result of a single study, you can say. Now, the different types and impact. So there are major impact, you can say the COPE classifies duplicate publication into major and the minor offense. The major offense is the one where duplicate publication is based on the same data set and findings which are already published. It is also considered there is evidence that the author tried to hide duplication by changing the title or you say the order of the authorship or by not referring the previous publication. So this is called as the major uh, offense. Coming to the minor offense, when you see this minor or you say the salami slicing is considered segmental publication or part of publication results or reanalysis derived from a single study. So authors do it uh, to increase the number of publications and you can say uh, the citations. So it is considered unethical and it is taken in a bad test because for a reader, it may cause distortions in the conclusions drawn, right? So the publication of the results of a single study in parts in different journals might lead to the overjudgment, or you say the wrong conclusions may be drawn from a study if it is done on a fixed number of uh, subjects, but the data are being presented in fragments in different journals. So it is also advisable that suppose if you have published your uh, study in a particular journal and you want to publish another man uh, manuscript from the same study as far as possible, you must publish in the same journal, right? So that there will be a series of publications and uh, people can know about your complete study. Now, 
if you see over here, uh, the articles have been retracted, right? Two and a half years after findings of the misconduct, this stem cell researchers up to 19 retractions, right? So a group of researchers at Achi Gakuin University of Nagoya, Japan, uh, continues to lose papers of duplication of images and text from their previous work and now up to 19 retraction. We'll discuss in details about these retractions, right? So as far as possible, you must prevent this uh, self-plagiarism. So avoid submitting a previously published paper or uh, for consideration in another journal. Avoid submitting papers that describe essentially the same research to, you say, the more than one journal. It is called as the self-plagiarism, as I mentioned, right? So avoid, provide, uh, whatever, whenever it is possible, as far as possible, always provide full disclosure about any previous submissions, including, as I said, the meeting presentations and posting of results in the registries that might be regarded as the duplicate publications. So uh, this should include disclosing previous publication of an abstract during the proceedings of the meeting, right? And avoid publication in the predatory journals. You can very well know uh, that which are the journals, which are predatory journals, we'll discuss in the coming slides, right? Now, when you see this predatory publishing is the publication of an article in the journal that lacks the usual feature of the editorial oversight, transparent policies, and operating procedure of the legitimate peer review journals. Now, to identify these predatory journals, what happens that you can go through the websites and on the websites, they will mention that the journal is un indexed under what are the indexing agencies. And you can go to the website of those indexing agencies. Suppose some open access journal is there and it uh, on the website, they have mentioned that this journal is indexed under DOAJ. So you go to the website of DOAJ and you try to search the name of the journal in the DOAJ. If it is there, it means uh, this journal is indexed under DOAJ. Similarly, uh, suppose they have mentioned that this journal is indexed under Scopus, right? And it is listed under SJR, so Simago Journal Ranking. So you can visit the site of the Simago Journal Ranking and you will find the name of the journal. Similarly, it applies with the PubMed. So that way you can, you will come to know that whether this journal is authentic or it is a predatory journal, right? In the predatory journal, usually they will mention the impact factor uh, much more than what we, what you will uh, see in the uh, reputed journals, right? So you should avoid publishing in the predatory journal. Now, uh, you can make out the fake journals. I said you can cross check the indexation by going to the various websites of the indexing agencies, right? And accordingly, you can self assess the journal based on the indexing agencies, based on the, you say, the impact factor, right? And apart from that, you can also go through this web website that is the thinkcheck.submit.org and you can uh, confirm the authenticity of the journal, whether it is uh, authentic journal or it is a predatory journal. Now we'll see the ethical approval. All research studies on humans must have been performed in accordance with the principle stated in the Declaration of Helsinki. And prior to starting the study, ethical approval must have been obtained from all protocols from the local institutional review board or other appropriate ethical committee to confirm that the study meets national and international guidelines for research on humans. Apart from that, a statement to confirm this must be included within the manuscript, which must provide uh, the details of the name of the Institutional Ethical Committee and reference or permission numbers wherever uh, it is applicable. 
Now, a statement confirming consent to publish has been obtained must be included within the manuscript. Apart from that, I would suggest that always take written uh, consent if you are publishing a case report, especially in case of the genetics. When putting images, completely ensure uh, the confidentiality of the study individual. Suppose if the images are there, it is better to cover the eyes so that the privacy or the confidentiality of the individual will be maintained. Apart from that, I would suggest that institutional ethical committee is mandatory for all the studies in anatomy, right? Usually people think that, okay, it is academic study, so ethical approval is not required. No, when, whenever you are dealing with the human tissues or animal tissues, you must get the ethical approval. Even if it has been waived off, you should have the waiver letter from the institutional ethical committee. And accordingly, you can mention in the manuscript. Now, coming to the acknowledgement uh, in our journal, apart from all the reputed or the standard, standard journals of anatomy across the globe, all this anatomical journal editors have recommended that we must acknowledge the use of human cadaveric tissues in the research papers. Accordingly, we must uh, mention the statement and cite this literature, which has been recommended by all the anatomical journal editors. The conflict of interest, very important. Why it is so important? Because when we see this conflict of interest, it is an attribute which is invisible to the reader or editor, but which may affect or influence his or her judgment or objectivity. Like when, suppose a study has been sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, right? So. The pharmaceutical company may uh, pressurize to get the uh, desired results as per the pharmaceutical companies, right? So we must mention this uh, direct, whatever is the conflict of interest that are directly or indirectly related to the research, which may include the research grants uh, from funding agencies, honorarium for speaking at the symposium, or any kind of the financial uh, grants, uh, be it from the, uh, the national uh, body like uh, ICMR, DBT, or DST, anything, we must mention that because the disclosure of this conflict of interest is the basic requirement uh, to prevent this attribution bias uh, in the research, you can say. And the International Committee for uh, this of Medical Journal Editors has produced a common form to disclose any kind of conflict of interest. And that has been individually uh, that signed by the each co-author. And it has to be uploaded along with the manuscript files. So uh, what I wanted to say that authors are supposed to declare the conflict of interest in the manuscript text as well, which is meant for the readers, so that the read reader will have uh, the clear cut knowledge about the uh, manuscript, the article uh, which has been published. Then coming to the fabrication or the uh, falsification of the data, uh, in other words, or in short form, you can say the cooking or the trimming of the data. So the fabrication, is the making up data or results, whereas the falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment, or the processes or changing or omitting data or results such that the result, uh, the research is not accurately represented in the research record. And as I uh, mentioned previously, that this fabrication or the falsification of the data is the gravest form of misconduct. Right, so we must avoid any kind of fabrication or falsification of the research data. Now, uh, it is noticed that the figures and graphics where uh, maximum fabrication or the falsification takes place. 
right? So the graphical manipulations are mainly through the photo, Photoshop. And let me tell you, the journal editors are struggling hard to fight against these high-tech manipulations on research data because of the uh, applications like uh, Photoshop. So the falsification or the fabrication may include the doubling the sample size or removing an outlier uh, from a series of the measurements or changing a measurement uh, to make it look higher or lower, adjusting the brightness of one particular gel band but not the other bands in the same photo. So these kind of manipulations are being done by some of the researchers and these are the gravest form of the misconduct, you can say. And here are some well-documented cases where researchers had to retract uh, papers because of uh, data falsification. Uh, let me tell you, in this MMR autism case, this Andrew Wakefield had undisclosed this monetary conflict of interest and was found to have violated human uh, subjects protection rule in research underlying an article which was published in the Lancet. And apart from that, in opinion of the British Medical uh, Journal, right, this Wakefield's also falsified data. And because of that, the Lancet has to retract uh, this paper. But it took a lot of time, almost a decade, you can say. And because of that, also it uh, affected, you can say, provided kind of support for this anti-vaccine movement, right? And this case not only confronts the issue of conflicts of interest, but also weaknesses in institutional research governance, or you say the responsibility of the co-author and even the responsibility of the journal. Then another case uh, regarding this Haruko Obukata, a 30-year-old Japanese stem cell researcher at the uh, Riken Center for Developmental Biology in Kobe is fast uh, coming to an end. Uh, what has happened? that this Dr. Obukata uh, shot to international prominence and became an overnight celebrity in Japan because of the publication of her two landmark paper in Nature's on uh, January 30 this year, you can say. So the latest controversy is about the irregularity in her research proposal, which was submitted when she applied for her current position in Riken, right? and the manner in which uh, she was heard. So this was a gross mistake. And because of that, these papers were uh, retracted because uh, use of the same image which was found in the paper apart from the plagiarized, uh, pla plagiarized text was there. Then another case, if you see over here, this Huang case, uh, this raises several important research integrity issues that in, uh, includes the data fabrication and uh, falsification, apart from that, the abuse of mentorship status and the University of Pittsburgh role in this case highlights the need for institutional oversight and defined standards uh, for the authorship roles, right? Then apart from that, another case was there related to uh, Dr. Ram B. Singh, which was a classical example of data fabrication, and is uh, what happened that uh, the editor of this BMJ, right, this British Medical Journal, uh, Professor Richard Smith, suspected on the uh, Dr. Singh's work and asked him to produce a raw data. But Dr. R. B. Singh was failed to produce and insisted that the data were eaten by termites. And it was also found that the institution where he was working was some of his relatives, right? Uh, that was the owned by his family members or relatives, you say. So BMJ initiated an independent inquiry and published his uh, story. As a result, what has happened that between 92 to 96, uh, there were nine papers uh, 
on diet and myocardial infarction, which were retracted. Now, the question arises, why this misconduct, right? There are various factors, actually, which induces this research misconduct, like publish or perish pressure. Suppose in some institutions, uh, there are uh, rules, like from, suppose if you, if you wish to get promoted from additional professor to, to professor, then you have to have 15 publications during those four years in the PubMed journal. So such kind of the pressure leads to the scientific misconduct. Then severe competition of funds in some institutions, uh, it is mandatory to have uh, the grants, right? The funds uh, to get promotion. Then, as I said, the promotion or the career advancement policies, these are the reasons uh, that compels the authors or the researchers or the faculty members to involve in the scientific misconduct. So apart from that, the pressure from the research sponsors to obtain the desired result, the lack of knowledge on the research ethics and desire to go ahead, these are the reasons for the misconduct. Now, the best practices, these, there are the organizations which give uh, recommendations and develop guidelines to assist the authors, the editors, the reviewers. And the purpose is to create and disseminate accurate, clear, uh, reproducible, unbiased research papers. And these are the organizations like International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, the World Association of Medical Editors, and the Committee on Publication Ethics. Uh, they form, they have given the guidelines for the uh, authors, the reviewers, and the editors for the best practices. Now, re related to the prevention of the misconducts, right? The author and the insured, which is primarily responsible for uh, the misconduct, hence they should be the vigilant, right? And to prevent this misconduct, uh, we should provide the better education, right? On publication guidelines and ethics, and then the introduction of registers for the planned and ongoing clinical trials. Apart from that, we should change the criteria from quantity to quality when papers are used for assessment of posts or yeah, you say about the grants. Apart from that, we must punish the culprits, but be careful that innocent uh, researchers should not be victimized because of the local politics. So at the end, I would like to say that the good scientific publication is a team effort of the authors, the journals, the uh, reviewers, right, the editors. It, it's a complete team effort, you can say, for our scientific publication. And let us abide by the ethics and build a healthy society. So science brings society to the next level, whereas the ethics keeps us there. So this is all about the publication ethics and the role and responsibility of the authors. So we must abide uh, with the ethics or uh, just to maintain the good publication practices. Thank you. Thank you so much.